This PowerPoint presentation attempts to explain the following points. First, why Banco Filipino failed. Second, why it should have been closed much earlier. Third, why the regulators failed to act in a timely manner. Fourth, why the inaction of the regulators led to a costlier failure for all concerned, namely, depositors, investors, and taxpayers. Fifth, why this inaction leads to an erosion of trust and confidence in the Philippine banking system. Sixth, why it also fosters an environment wherein a bank owner can steal from his own bank and do so with impunity. For the first seven years since its reopening, from 1994 until 2001, Banco Filipino remained profitable. Total banking income was up. Earnings were positive. It only began to lose money in 2002, when the bank had to be rescued by the BSP. Loans grew significantly, climbing 26% a year. In 1994, loans stood at 848 million pesos. By 2002, loans amounted to 5.4 billion pesos. Deposits grew even faster, by 31% a year. In 1994, the deposit base was 660 million pesos. By 2002, the deposit base was 5.75 billion pesos. Meanwhile, Acquired assets grew just as fast, by 23% a year. In 1994, acquired assets stood at 580 million pesos. By 2002, it stood at 3 billion pesos. Acquired assets jumped by 83% in 2001, after the BSB comptrollership was lifted in 2000. In 2002, it jumped another 45%. By 2002, acquired assets made up almost 25% of the bank's total asset base. Acquired assets grew so much that asset sales outstripped banking revenues by 2001. Banco Filipino looked and performed more like a real estate company and less like a bank. Without acquired asset income, Banco Filipino was actually losing money, starting in 2000. In 2000, net income without acquired asset income, was a net loss of 431 million pesos. In 2001, the loss tripled to 1.5 billion pesos. In 2002, it lost 1.1 billion pesos. Banco Filipino's liquidity position was severely reduced by the conversion of liquid earning assets into acquired assets. Its quick assets to total deposits ratio, which measures the ability to meet deposit withdrawals, declined steeply. In 1994, that ratio stood at a healthy 91.6%. By 2001, the ratio was down to only 22.6%. In 2002, it was even lower, at 12.2%. The largest percentage drops in liquidity occurred in 2001, approximately negative 41.6%. And, in 2002, liquidity dropped another 45.8%. So liquidity was already very poor by the time the BSP extended a 180-day special liquidity facility to Banco Filipino on December 2, 2002. Of the 3.5 billion peso package, 1.34 billion pesos was availed of in 2002. By June 19, 2003, Banco Filipino met most definitions of insolvency. 81% of its total loan portfolio was non-performing. 67% of its total loan portfolio was classified as DOSRI, or insider loans. The DOSRI loans were concentrated among just 17 borrowers. Banco Filipino's troubles in 2002 were not caused by poor management, or by a liquidity crisis, or by a smear campaign. It was caused by fraud. In 2002 and 2003, minority shareholder, Ana Maria Aguirre Carula, asked the BSP to investigate the bank. 
she claimed that Banco Filipino's management and directors had, number one, engaged in unsafe, unsound, and even fraudulent banking practices. Number two, engaged in self-dealing. Number three, broke banking laws prohibiting or limiting DOS rate transactions, and put the bank and its depositors in jeopardy. The minority shareholder sued not just Banco Filipino's board and management, but also sued both the BSP and the monetary board, to replace current board and management, and place the bank under receivership. The complaint documented, around 1.95 billion pesos in loans, to six dummy borrower corporations, made from 2000 to 2002. These dummy corporations are, namely, BF Home Depot, Filipino Vastland, Glamour World, Pro Managers, Taurus Land, and Tiyurasud. These six dummy corporations all operated on a similar modus operandi. Namely, lent favorably to dummy corporations affiliated with Banco Filipino Vice Chairman, Bobby Aguirre. These dummy corporations did not have the financial capacity to justify the loans, at the time of loan approval. The dummy corporations would then provide Banco Filipino with collateral properties, from other corporations affiliated with Banco Filipino Vice Chairman, Bobby Aguirre. The bank would then appraise the collateral properties at inflated valuations. The dummy corporations would not pay any interest or principal on the loans. Instead, they would settle their loan obligations, via Dacian and Pago, meaning, turning over ownership of their collateral properties to Banco Filipino, and in turn, Banco Filipino discharging the borrowers of all liabilities, within months of loan approval. This modus operandi became the preferred way for drawing large amounts of cash, out of Banco Filipino for the benefit of BF Vice Chairman, Bobby Aguirre. It was a way of disposing, or selling, unsaleable real estate to Banco Filipino. It allowed Banco Filipino to continue to reflect a profit, and deflect regulatory scrutiny. The dations made by the dummy corporations explained the jump in acquired assets, from 2000 to 2002. The six dummy corporations had no financial capacity to justify the loans, at the time of loan approval. On the balance sheet side, the size of their assets were small relative to the size of the loan. Paid up capital was also small relative to the size of the loan. For instance, one dummy corporation, Pro Managers, had assets and paid up capital of less than 1 million pesos in the year before it received a 350 peso loan from Banco Filipino. On the income statement side, net sales was minimal. Net income was often negligible, or even negative. Dummy Corporation, BF Home Depot, had no revenues and had lost 1 million pesos the year before it received a loan of 359 million pesos, from Banco Filipino. The dummy corporations had a common cast of interlocking directors and officers. This common cast of characters all have business and personal links to BF Vice Chairman, Bobby Aguirre. The dummy corporations all had interlocking ownerships. In other words, they own or are owned by other dummy corporations that have borrowed, defaulted, and settled their loan obligations, via Dacian and Pago. For instance, Taurus Land, which borrowed 270 million pesos, owned 81% of Glamour World, which also borrowed 270 million pesos. Glamour World, in turn, owned 74% of its parent. Taurus land. The dummy corporations all had common corporate addresses. For instance, Filipino Vastland listed its corporate address as 1015 Executive Center, Tropical Avenue, Los Pinos City. This is known as the personal residence of Banco Filipino Vice Chairman, Bobby Aguirre. The loan proceeds were not applied to the borrower's stated purposes. For instance, 
BF Home Depot, which was approved for a 359 million peso loan on March 24, 2000, for the purpose of financing inventory to stock a retail establishment that would sell home furnishings and fixtures. BF Home Depot never paid any interest or principal on the loans, but settled its loans, via Dacian and Pago, on July 24, 2001. The site of its proposed retail establishment has remained a chicken coop, years after the loan disbursement. The collateral for the loans to the dummy corporations, was provided by other corporations related to BF Vice Chairman. Albert C. Aguirre. The collateral property values were often appraised at grossly overinflated values at the time of loan approval. For instance, BF Home Depot's collateral was valued at 60,000 pesos per square meter or 12 times its independently appraised value of 5,000 pesos per square meter. The loans were often settled, via Dacian, within months of the loan release. In the case of Glamour World, which borrowed 270 million pesos, the period from loan release to Dacian settlement took only 22 days. Given these dubious transactions, it is not surprising that Banco Filipino needed BSP's help in 2002. It would not be surprising if there were many more such dubious transactions. However, BSP did nothing to address the concerns of the minority shareholders. It only reinstalled a controller, as a condition of the emergency loans it extended to Banco Filipino, in December 2002. Meanwhile, Banco Filipino operations continued to deteriorate. Losses accumulated, reaching 12.1 billion pesos from 2003 to 2008. From 2007 to 2010, losses vastly exceeded its capital base of 1.6 billion pesos as of March 2004, every single year. It lost 4.2 billion pesos in 2007. 2.4 billion pesos in 2008, 2.6 billion pesos in 2009, and 2.7 billion pesos for the first nine months of 2010. Banco Filipino's loan portfolio has remained stagnant, despite the 9.2 billion peso growth in deposits. With non-performing loans at 77%, the bank had very little in terms of unencumbered earning assets to generate additional banking revenue and curb losses. BSB characterized this as a Ponzi scheme. The bank was kept alive by the infusion of new deposits. The bank grew deposits by offering interest rates as much as 5.75% above market rates. BSB had many chances to close the bank. The bank could have been closed in 2002, when the bank experienced a run and was rescued by BSB. It could have been closed in 2004, when 86% of the loans were non-performing. It could have been closed in 2007, when losses reached 4.2 billion pesos. Or, it could have been closed in the first quarter of 2009, when the bank experienced another liquidity crisis, and needed a cumulative total of 4.1 billion pesos, in overnight clearing lines from the BSP.